Welcome to Cargo Film Presents. I'm Dave. And I'm Dan. In Cargo Film Presents, we present uh, new documentaries that uh, we'd like to introduce to you and, and, and uh, tell you why we think you should check them out. Today, we're going to be talking about Crime of the Century. It's a, uh, a film on HBO Max uh, by the very prolific filmmaker, Alex Gibney. Incredible, uh, the kind of output Alex Gibney has had over the years, but you know he's certainly attached to some some of the best documentaries of the last uh, you know 10, 15 years. Taxi to the Dark Side, Enron, uh, The Inventor uh, was a more recent one, and uh, Crime of the Century is is a uh, two part, four hour, in depth explanation of how the uh, the drugs that caused the crisis uh, that came to be known as the opioid crisis and how companies aggressively promoted and distributed uh, these drugs and how the governments failed to act swiftly enough and effectively enough to, to save lots and lots of lives. You can make a lot of money getting doctors to prescribe a medication to people who don't need it. Hundreds and hundreds of sales reps go out and meet with doctors. The doctor, he's a businessman. I got to show him the WIFM, what's in it for me. The, uh, the film's uh, first part kind of explores the Sackler family's Purdue Pharma and their developing of the prescription uh, painkiller Oxycontin, which essentially is heroin and how they pushed to get doctors to overprescribe the medication and the company's use of former government regulators to remove serious oversight. The second part is the sudden rise of uh, fentanyl, which is an opiate uh, that's 100 times as powerful as morphine and mainly focuses on the rise and fall of a company called Insys and how they duped insurance companies to approve it and doctors to overprescribe what was essentially an end of life uh, med medication. So the film's a peeling back of the curtain of an unregulated Wild West look at the business practices and government neglect of uh, big pharma with uh, keep complete disregard for people's lives. So with that, what did you think? Uh, for a second there, I thought you were gonna rattle off all of, all of Alex Gibney's films and that could just fill a whole episode of Carl oh, yeah. Film Presents, right? Absolutely. He's <laughs> super prolific. And, My goodness. Yeah, I mean, to me, there was a, there was a sense that the film and, and Gibney were trying so hard to get you to watch this film about mm. a subject matter that you'd probably rather not, the opioid epidemic, um, you know, the crime of the century and Purdue and Big Pharma are drug kingpins and, and suits. And like, don't worry, this isn't a social issue film. This is a, a true crime, you know, murder mystery. What if the opioid epidemic started with the crimes, the, the kind of the, the hook of the film, you know, and right. which part of me kind of understood. I mean, the opioid epidemic has kind of torn through America, especially, you know, poor and rural America. I think it's like 500,000 death toll at this point. Yeah. And, uh, and yet like people just don't want to pay attention, you know, despite the damage it's, it's, uh, I coined the, it's the opioid in the room kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but that said, I think, you know, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's two parts, it's four hours and there's a certain overzealousness to the film that, you know, kind of starts to work against it because, you know, much of this information we, we sort of know already. And, right. you know, if part one is kind of a saga of, uh, greed, uh, uh, and corruption and a kind of horrific train wreck, then part two is kind of the same train wreck, <laughs> except with a slightly different conductor. So I kind of wanted off the train after part one. Yeah. Um, but I'm still, you know, at the same time, I'm kind of grateful for Alex uh, Gibney for making these films. You know, he's one of the, the great muckrakers of our time for democracy and, and trying to hold power accountable. I just, yeah, I just wish yeah. uh, it weren't four hours and you know. Well, that's the thing, right? I agree. I mean, I do feel it's it's too long. And to your point, if they're trying to stylistically uh, invite people to to watch this this story, why would you make it four hours? Yeah. I mean, you don't you know, don't you want people to watch this? You're reducing by half the number of people who will watch this because it is four hours long. So, you know, uh, I, I just I, I just don't understand that that decision. Uh, you know, for instance, the last 30 minutes of part two really feels like a paint by numbers, true crime doc. You know, they're going out on a stakeout to catch right. this, this fentanyl distributor and so on. And, 
you know, and, and they tell this really tragic story of a teen that, that died because of, of an overdose of, of fentanyl. So, you know, so especially with a, a film that already has two parts, four hours long, you know, we just didn't need that extra 30 minute true crime piece. However, you know, I, I, I do feel like, you know, people should watch this. It, can, it does convey that, that how drug makers and, and the medical profession as well being complicit have taken advantage of the system and, and, got, and got away with it for, for many years. And, uh, you know, using uh, what is the tried and true technique of buying politicians uh, often to change policy. And, um, you know, if you're not spending a tremendous amount of effort countering these companies uh, lobbying and, and buying influence in Washington, you know, in Washington government will, will not help and won't help and, and the con and consequences will, will follow. Basically, here's some money, write some scripts. Yes, I'm looking at this and I'm going, clearly we're breaking the law. Purdue ends up getting pursued by the authorities. The company lied under oath. Ethics did not play a role. The companies took out their checkbooks and paid to keep the evidence hidden. You are basically telling pharmaceutical companies you have a green light to do this. That's right. You know, it does feature one of um, one of America's favorite politicians these days, Rudy Giuliani, who mm -hmm. uh, used parlayed his popularity of being America's mayor uh, into um, you know. Uh, lobbying on behalf of these these drug companies but that was that was early on in his you know was post uh mayor of new york city so his his reputation wasn't com completely <laughs> tarnished as it is now so he still had some some cred back then which he probably used to, to great effect yeah yeah absolutely and then i mean also i guess and i suppose of most you know many people might know this already but the use of um you know just paying fines which appear to be very hefty, you know, hundred million dollar fines. I think most recently there's a, I think it's three hundred fifty million dollar fine uh, mm -hmm. for Purdue or someone for for uh, the yep. production of OxyContin. And you know, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars of profits. So it appears as if there's some kind of justice being served when actually there isn't. Um, you know, so I thought that was maybe an interesting point to highlight. And then also, um, you know, maybe a, a lesser known point that people might not know is the the kind of distribution, the implication of the distribution system of, mm -hmm. of pharmaceuticals and drugs, these um, maybe lesser known companies like Cardinal Health, who are supposed to flag, um, you know, some uh, when there are, you know, really massive shipments of opioids going to pharmacies throughout the countries and they, you know, just let it happen as well. Um, yeah. You know, so we do get a little bit of insight into how the sort of um, distribution system of of uh, yeah. drugs and pharmaceuticals work to the country and the fact that they have a, a record of everything, every drug that's being um, sent and distributed throughout the country. So, I mean, you know, it's not just the Purdue Pharma and some of these big pharma companies, it's sort of the whole medical uh, industry and establishment that's, that's implicated in this, which is deeply depressing and disturbing. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. I, I didn't know that, you know, that there are three companies that all the drugs that are prescription medicines uh, go go through. Uh, three companies control that. Why it's set up that way, I, I have no idea. And, and you're right, at, at every step of the way, be it from the drug makers, being from the distribut distributors and, and to the, um, you know, to the doctors themselves, there, there was, you know, corruption and greed uh, you know, happening. You know, there was also this element of uh, how laws and policy, you know, gets made in Washington, and 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 th that was really dispiriting. You know, you see how these laws are passed and intended to, you know, they were intended to defang the DEA, who were uh, wanting to take action against drug companies that they felt were being irresponsible. And you just didn't. You got the distinct impression that many of these politicians did not even understand what they were voting for when when some of these uh, this policy language came through, which for me was one of the, probably one of the scariest revelations. You know, it, it, it shows how they kind of couch this policy, you know, to help big pharma with misleading uh, names and language and make it appear that the law is actually helping Americans, but in fact, it's doing the opposite. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess it's been sort of a running joke for a long time. That's become really unfunny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I was just listening uh, today on the news about some of the tangentially the Georgia vote, you know, voter uh, laws mm -hmm. in Georgia, 
what started as like three pages ballooned into like, you know, a hundred page uh, document for the law that had two hours of debate and then was passed. And you're just like, no one had the time to read, you know, this, any, any of this document. So yeah, it's definitely a, a joke. That's not, <laughs> not funny anymore. And I mean, you know, there's just, yeah, there's good, there's good stuff in it. Like that, you mentioned the D agent, I think his name was, and I'll probably get it wrong. Joe uh, Ranazzisi, a, a good solid Italian name. That's like right. That. <laughs> I didn't want to butcher it. <laughs> Ranazzisi, yeah, like I was a he's a fascinating character, and you get like a bit a bit of his story. You get bits of you know sort of personal stories along the way, and so it did feel um, you know kind of unbalanced the whole thing. Like sometimes it wanted to be a you know uh, a, a true crime. This is you know. Right. Uh, this is like how you become a drug kingpin as a pharmaceutical company. And then other times you get these really heartfelt personal stories of a, you know, of a, a husband whose wife, you know, was pres prescribed massive amounts of opioids, despite him trying to stop the doctor from doing so. And, and eventually she did die. Um, so you get, you know, some of those personal anecdotes, another guy who kind of, um, he becomes a drug, an opioid dealer and like, you know, totally out of the blue he, you know he, he gets addicted himself and then starts selling and you know law enforcement is very surprised that just some random guy has like a massive opioid lab or fentanyl lab in his, like, in his garage yeah. um, so there's like a lot of yeah you know, interesting kind of anecdotes and things going on but it just yeah it just didn't feel right the that structure of two parts to contain all this stuff and, and to do it in a way that kept you gripped for the whole thing right. Yeah, they, I think they try to stuff a lot in. I mean, you know, it was done in association with uh, the Washington Post, we should say, you know, who are contributors to this. And, you know, yeah. Gibney is known for his journalistic uh, chops as well. And, uh, you know, it, it is it is well researched. And I think they uh, just didn't leave a lot of, a lot of stuff on the uh, cutting room uh, floor, you know, bringing in all these personal stories, journalists, insiders. It's, it's just a lot. You know, I think they're trying to be like the definitive account, you know, of the opioid uh, crisis, you know, and, you know, what if, if I liked anything about it is how, you know, there is this kind of um, attempt at uh, a public reckoning of, of not only the drug companies, but the politicians uh, as, as well, you know, shaming big pharma and, uh, you know, especially even more so the politicians and aiding and abetting uh, the uh, you know with the the ease with which drug companies uh, can function and flood the marketplace with opioids with little or or no oversight. So I, I like that they they went after these politicians and called them out. I mean, um, if if government re regulators are are not going after them, well then maybe you know people like Alex Gibney, you know you know we need people like that in the world to expose them for for what the what they're doing. So. Uh, and it's it's not ancient history just yet. You know these people are still in, in government and or or working. So I, I appreciated that. You're right. They did they did access some I guess some new uh, and I'm not entirely you know current with what uh, you know what new information there is out there. But the team I guess Gibney and the Washington Post did they did reveal some um, information from court depositions. I believe the the deposition with uh, Sack, Richard Sackler had never been seen before, right? Maybe so you do get to see his incredibly arrogant and smarmy. Uh, a lot, lot of a lot of hate watching going on there. Oh yeah, I mean that guy is just, oof, it's just so <laughs> callous and and arrogant. You know when yeah. when pressed yeah. with some of these questions about you know what Purdue Pharma knew at the time, um, when clearly they knew a lot more than. Uh, than they were saying and certainly right. he was saying and then you know took all of that all of their uh, profits and proceeds from purdue pharma uh and uh you know put them into bank accounts somewhere offshore probably <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know certainly um a kind of villain a villain of the piece yeah once you got them hooked you were going to get the reoccurring prescriptions it would almost take me 15 minutes just to eat them all 25 twice a day you know, it was like sitting down to a bowl of Cheerios. Did I really care about being responsible? No. Yeah, I mean, you know, the second part, of course, spends time with that company, Insys, and, yeah. and their uh, manufacturer of, of fentanyl uh, and how they encourage doctors to overprescribe, you know, what is a super strong, highly addictive opioid that was that's really meant for a very, very niche group of end-of-life cancer 
patients and you know the, that case study was was it was, I suppose, entertaining, yeah. if only for the fact because it introduced you to this guy, Alex Berlikov, uh, kind of a status hungry, you know, kind of used car like sales guy who kind of lays it all out, you know, providing a lot of insight and not only in how the company, you know, went about duping insurance companies, but also, you know, he was pretty, pretty open about his own shortcomings of character and weakness and, and the people he worked with. And, um, yeah, I mean, that part of the story kind of reminded me of another uh, film, a doc from a couple, a few years ago called The Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, which uh, was main takeaway essentially was how regulators went out after kind of a small fish in the big financial meltdown to show that they were prosecuting, you know, corporate criminals, but stayed away from, from the big banks. And I felt that that insist was, was, you know, it's not J&J, it's not Purdue Pharma, yeah. where they got away with fines, but they really went after insist, you know, which is a smaller operation, operation, which deserved to be shut down, no doubt, but the big boys kind of got off the hook, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I suppose none of those bigger companies would be willing to talk to Alex Gibney at no. any, you know, any time <laughs> until yeah. the end of time, but, you know, yeah, there was a feeling in which, you know, you kind of wanted him to get a little deeper further i mean you did get some you know some of the uh villains like berlikoff and lynn webster in the first yeah. part you know who was running a pain clinic and was just handing out you know opioids like like candy and yeah um you know so you do get access to some of those guys but you know yeah i, I suppose he didn't he wasn't able to get any further i mean he didn't have any access to the purdue uh sackler family or you know any other right big, uh, big operators in the, in the pharmaceutical space. Yeah. And yeah. That character, Lynn Webster was particularly, uh, captivating, uh, just to me because the, um, the idea that he, he seemed to at least present the idea that he actually believed that what he was uh, prescribing was, was helping people. He seemed to have drunk the Kool-Aid, yes. uh, yeah. but, uh, but, um, you know, uh, never, never uh, for a, a moment seemed to let his guard down to make him think that he was doing it for uh, ulterior motives, but for the, you know, health of his patients. So I, I wonder if that was an, you know, accurate uh, representation, but, but perhaps there were individuals like that who actually uh, believed in, in, in the hype and, and thought that they were, um, you know, actually doing, doing some good, but boy, you've got to be really, really, um, you know, got those blinders on for to not to not see the the results of that. Um, you know, the toll that it's taken on on patients. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and Gibney did try very hard to get him yeah. to you know admit the contradiction in his yeah. in his logic and his thinking. But he was a man that just wouldn't he wouldn't crack. You know, he was yeah. a really true believer, as you say. He, he drank the Kool Aid. Um, you know, yeah, I was. I, I'm just shocked that, that a man like that still has a, a medical license. I hope does he? he I yeah, mean, I hope he doesn't. Apparently, the, I, I think in the film, so the charges were brought against him, then dropped. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, there you go. I mean, this is a film that, you know, to me, at the end of the day, it's something that I've seen time and time again as being a uh, kind of a Canadian in, in America that speaks to the aversion of regulation and oversight in this country. You know, it, it's kind of uh, America is known for 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 some of that you know which also led to other fiascos like the uh, financial crisis and, and so on you know the ethos being that uh, you want to do with uh, away with regulation and oversight so people and companies can make money as quickly as possible and i really believe that that's a uh, one of the weaknesses of uh, of the uh, american society and its economic system you know people make money but inevitably you know you will have people and companies that take advantage that create mistrust between citizens and the people who were elected to protect them. So ultimately, we lose. When the companies didn't like that they were being held accountable, they decided to change the statute. They should be changing their behaviors, not the rules. People were dying by the tens of thousands, and their own representatives are basically selling them down the river. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh creates you know it creates an environment for predators really and uh unfortunately we're in the arena of you know medical care uh that's one arena where you don't want these kinds of predators op operating yeah, right. and uh you know you want protections for uh you know for your citizens and people so 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with you there. And um, I mean, I guess if you just a few other quick thoughts I had on it, I mean, mm. I thought it was also fascinating that, you know, you can, you know, how much they shifted the, uh, the sort of language around pain and, you know, creating yep. new categories of pseudo addiction. So, you know, where people supposedly, they weren't actually addicted, they just looked like they were addicted and drug seeking and, you know, were able to get this also and kind of like, I think it was some medical or scientific journals, you know, so that it would just allow this, um, you know, over prescription to, to, con mm -hmm. to continue. Um, Changing the definition of language and words and uh, as it relates to patient care. Yeah, big, it was a big uh, element of, uh, of the uh, drug companies and ability to, to over have doctors or prescribe this medication. But let's face it, you know, doctors, some point uh, decided to buy in because uh, because hey you know it's uh, you know they uh, make more money and you're you're going yeah. to get uh, a certain number of doctors that will uh, you know buy into to that to that strategy you know there was also that uh, chart that uh, Erlikov pointed out right. to where he color coded the doctors and you know uh, blue green red and and something but I think it was the red that you know were the, tar the doctors he he was after, which were the ones that were, uh, had too many patients, didn't have much time to talk to sales companies and were motivated by money. Those were his prime candidates to, to, to push the drug out to, uh, to patients for uh, something as small as, you know, a, uh, a pain in your, in your big toe. Right. So. Yeah, and that's all, you know, that's all it kind of took to, you know, upend the whole system and create these pill mills is you just, you know, you, you target, you know, greedy doctors, uh, negligent doctors, and, and there you go. Yeah. I mean, I will say, you know, I, I, I guess the last thing I had to say about this is I was, I guess, a little surprised that Gibney didn't, you know, dig f further. I know we mentioned he went after some of the politicians who were you know, maybe yeah. in the pocket of Big Pharma, but I, I was surprised he didn't go into you know, this question around the policy of when they realized all these pill mills were popping up all over the country and they just started cutting them off, um, you know, and right. they thought that the solution to the problem was to stop over prescribing and that would, you know, control right. the opioid epidemic, which was a huge mistake. You know, right. I mean, essentially you're just cutting off all of these people, you know, from highly addictive drugs and then just they're sort of left to their own devices, you know, which then led to even more overdoses and also seeking, you know, street fentanyl and synthetic opioids that were being flooded into the country, you know, by um, actual drug cartels. And so, you know, you just, um, you know, you solve the problem by just leaving it up to the, you know, uh, individual lives of the uh, drug addicts and, and people addicted to, to painkillers, which was just, uh, I mean, it's insane to do, yeah. it seems to do that and not try and create programs, I think, which now, you know, we're seeing Biden, the Biden administration, you know, talking about doing, setting up and spending more money on, on actual sort of treatment centers and facilities and things of that nature for, for people who have been afflicted by drug addiction and the opioid epidemic, rather than just, you know, leaving them to fend for themselves on the streets. Um, so I was a little, I was like, well, you know, what, what about that? I mean, he does talk a little bit about how, um, you know, many people were were then preyed on by drug cartels and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature in, in the second part of the film. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the drug companies created a whole b uh, millions of, of, of addicts and, and then cut, cut them off. And, and yeah, it was, they, they were pushed to, to, to you know, buy, get their fix uh, underground. So um, on the black market, I should say. So, um, um, so yeah, that did, did make the uh, problem worse. And of course, you know, we're not going to get into it now, but there, uh, you know, Florida makes an appearance in this documentary as well. And, and a lot of docs that we speak about there, there seems to, you know, especially when it comes to um, uh, things of uh, having to do with uh, corruption and or crime, Florida some, somehow kind of, you know, uh, finds, finds a way into the story and, and, uh, and it does so here. So, um, you know, that this is a crime of the century by Alex Gibney. We will leave you with, uh, the, the, the death toll of 500,000 Americans that have died from opioid-related overdoses since 2000. So thanks for uh, 
checking this out and uh, check out check out 